throughout June and July of 2023, a mass phenomenon event occurred on the internet known only as the Barbie craze. During this time period, you couldn't go more than two minutes on the internet without seeing something Barbie related, whether it be songs, memes, trends, or annoying little men complaining about it, the whole entire thing was completely inescapable. But despite all the hype around Barbie, it is still a franchise that I am completely unfamiliar with. That is, until today. Because today I'm gonna to be watching and talking about every single Barbie movie, and believe me, that is a long list, man. We're gonna be going over everything from Nutcracker Barbie, to Video Game Barbie, to Space Barbie, to Spy Barbie, to Magic Barbie, to Mermaid Barbie, to Barbie in an interactive horror adventure, to Barbie Starts a Metalcore Side Project, to Barbie and the Magic of Pegasus 3D. There is so much goddamn Barbie, it's honestly insane. So here's how it's gonna work. I'm gonna watch each movie in semi-chronological order, give a recap of it, review it, and if I play my cards right, it'll only take around 60 hours. Jesus Christ. Why are people so passionate over these movies? Are they legitimately good, or is it just purely based in nostalgia? Where does Barbie get all the money to afford her mansions? Does Eat the Rich include Barbie? Is the franchise going to be similar in trajectory to that of Scooby-Doo, where it starts off very safe and formulaic, but eventually gets way more convoluted and bites off more than it can chew? And what will watching this many hours of Barbie content even do to my brain? I don't know. So let's find out the hard way. The year is 2001, and the Barbie film franchise has officially made its debut with Barbie in the Nutcracker, and it is pretty mediocre. If you couldn't piece together based off of the title, it's essentially just the Nutcracker, but with Barbie just kind of slapped on there. The plot follows Clara, whose parents are dead, so she has to live with her grandpa until her aunt gives her a Nutcracker that supposedly contains the heart of a prince, and this kind of sounds like a horror movie setup, but it's not. And then Rat Tim Curry shows up and shrinks her with magic, and the only way to get her normal size is to find the sugar plum princess, but of course. There's a little boy with a stupid hair cut and the worst drip I've ever seen. A bunch of hijinks ensue, there's an annoying British guy, and long story short, they find the sugar plum princess, and it was just Clara the whole time, meaning the entire journey was just kinda pointless. <laughs> I'm ragging on it more than it deserves. There's a lot of funny moments, I like the bat, there's some funny bits. I just gonna give it like a 5.5. It's not bad, but just not that great either. Also, it was written by three people, which like, no offense to them, but does it really take three people to look at a pre-existing piece of art and just go, Hey, do you want to copy this? It's their first movie ever, so you can't really blame them for not wanting to do anything ambitious or different just yet, but I know that that changes in the future, so let's progress. Barbie as Rapunzel. Do you know the story of Rapunzel? It's essentially that, only Barbie's there and there's like 30 talking animals for some reason. There's a gay weasel who keeps moaning for no reason and I wish I was joking. Give him to me. Uh. Susie from Rugrats plays Spyro the dragon and also there's like a British rabbit who's forgettable. There's the paintings from Dark Souls that you could walk into because she paints with magic or whatever. There's a sword battle, that's kind of cool, but it's ultimately just a bunch of padding to a story that already exists. Much like one of those Disney live action remakes, it's kind of cool, but ultimately just a thing that already exists, so kind of what's the point? I give it a six, it's nothing crazy, but it's very clear that they are still too afraid to take any risks. And let me just say, I'm aware that people are very opinionated on which Barbie movies are good, bad, overrated, etc. I've seen people get into like heated arguments and comment sections randomly. So I'm fully aware that I'm treading on thin ice right now, but don't worry, there are a bunch of Barbie movies that I do actually like that I watched today, but Barbie of Swan Lake, is not one of them. This one's not good, I'm sorry. In this one, Barbie becomes friends with a unicorn, goes to an enchanted forest, and falls in love with a prince. Who could have seen any of those things coming? There's an evil guy, and he uses an infinity stone to turn her into a swan, and it's really weird to look at. There's like eight dance scenes in it, and all of them are unnecessary and go on for like three whole minutes. I give this one a five. It's not even really worth discussing. I don't get the hype, I'm sorry. I know I'm being harsh, but it's just, it, it's like the whole early Scooby-Doo thing that I thought would happen. It's all just too safe, too formulaic. If you've seen one, you kind of seen them all. Or at least that's what I thought at first. 
uh, because then I watched this banger, and oh my god, this movie's actually pretty good. The voice acting in this one, phenomenal. The villain is essentially just Farquaad, but not short. Also, the songs in this one are legitimately good. By the way, these movies have songs now. This is like the introduction of like it being a musical, kind of, and it's kind of good. Okay, so the plot. So if you couldn't tell already, it's two people born to different families looking the exact same, born at the same place in the same time, roughly. One of them is poor and hates life. Life. One of them is rich and hates life and what's that? We're speaking in tandem. Let's trade places. You know, it's one of those. Um, but only at first glance. Because just when you think you know where the plot is going, its surprise becomes a political drama. The princess gets kidnapped and the pauper is forced to take her place, otherwise it will destable the kingdom that is actively in poverty, by the way. Kidnappings occur, mutinies occur, people get prison sentences in this movie. Dude, Farquaad tries to kill Barbie in this one, like actually kill. It's like some Game of Thrones shit. Overall, I give this one a 7.6. It's actually pretty good. I like this one. Up next, we have Barbie Fairytopia, aka the one with Bibble in it. There's a lot of side characters in Barbie movies, but it looks like Bibble is like the like the Jar Jar Binks of the of the Barbie franchise, I guess. This one's pretty straightforward. She's a fairy, but she doesn't have wings. There's an evil witch who wants to take over Fairytopia, and she looks like yassified Jared Leto's Joker. Barbie saves the day, gets her wings. It's a very by the numbers plot. You pretty much know where it's all going within the first three minutes. Overall, it didn't really do it for me. I imagine if I had a bunch of nostalgia tied to this movie, I would like it much better, but overall, I give it a 5.5. <laughs> Barbie and the Magic of Pegasus. Yo, this movie slaps so much harder than I thought it would. This movie's like on some Wizard 101 shit. It's really cool. This one also has a wacky polar bear sidekick who is wearing false lashes for some reason. It's a little weird to look at. But enough about that. Here's the plot. This lady, right? She's a princess. Big shocker. She loves to ice skate, but her parents, the king and queen, don't want her to ice skate because princesses don't ice skate or something. I don't know. I don't really understand their reasoning. But she's a rebel and she decides to ice skate anyways and when she's ice skating to purposefully stunt on all the poor people uh, an evil guy shows up and is like hey surprise uh, you're gonna marry me also you have a sister surprise there I killed her by the way and then he freezes everyone King Neptune style including her parents oh my god and then a Pegasus just like kind of just shows up and takes her away and all of this happens in like the span of one minute it's really intense oops surprise you know the secret sister that we just learned about 10 seconds ago it turns out she's not dead and she actually got turned into a pegasus that she's currently riding and they're going to go to the kingdom in the clouds where there are other pegasuses waiting to be ridden and if it feels like i'm giving you whiplash the movie just does that it's so much it just throws so much at you it's awesome there's a point where she gets kidnapped by a giant ogre and is going to be made into a stew and she talks her way out of it by just kind of body shaming him and making him feel self-conscious about himself in general so that he like does other things so that she could escape. It's actually pretty funny. And there's like an ice dungeon stuff where Indiana Jones things happen. I didn't expect much when I started it, but oh my God, it's actually kind of good. I give it an eight. Now, if you're feeling a little bit of Barbie fatigue at this point, I don't blame you, but this next Barbie movie is different very different. So far, it's been the classic era of Barbie movies. She's a fairy, she's a princess, she's always wearing a poofy dress and being ladylike and responsible in a magical fairy tale land. If this type of movie was a sound, it would be a magical chime effect, and there's nothing wrong with that, that's great. But the Barbie Diaries, however, if that was a sound effect, It'd be royalty-free rock and roll. In this one, she's just a teenager dealing with actual real-world problems in current modern-day times, not witches and trolls and ye old whatever. She's in a band. She hangs out in garages. She canonically is the first princess to go to Waffle House, and that is not a joke. She's friends with someone who dresses in all black, plays the drums, and says expletives like kick butt, which is a pretty hardcore departure from all the other previous films. In this one, Barbie wants to be the school news anchor, but... Her ex-best friend slash popular girl slash total bitch totally stole her job from her and now she's forced to be her assistant. That is until Barbie pulls a misery business and steals her man from her. You go, Barbie. That's awesome. She also finds a magic notebook where everything she writes in it becomes true, so it's essentially just like Mean Girls meets Death Note, and I mean, come on, that's pretty cool. The dialogue is super catty. The plot is actually pretty enjoyable. Honestly, 
In terms of Barbie movies, I'm giving this one a nine. I liked this one. And that concludes day one. I watched like six or seven Barbie movies, which is objectively way too much. I'm gonna go watch uh, six other Barbie movies and report back to you tomorrow. All right, see ya. All right, so I've watched seven more Barbie movies and um, I think I have retinal damage. Anyways, Barbie Fairytopia Mermaidia. <laughs> I'm gonna be real with you, this one sucks. I do not get the hype. Also, you can't have Adia as a suffix twice in your movie title. It's just so messy. The plot to this one is so forgettable. It's just the villain from the first one. Well, she wants an immunity berry so she could do the first movie again. There's a turtle that's like legitimately scary to look at and there's this other thing that's also scary. She gives up becoming a fairy to become a mermaid but because of the power of self-sacrifice she gets to be a fairy again. I don't- I just watched it and I already don't remember. I liked the blue mermaid. She was cool. Um, I like- uh, there's a bit where Bibble becomes a black guy and that's not a joke. That's actually in the movie and that- that's actually pretty funny. A story is only as good as its villain and the villain in this one is just a recycled villain and it's mostly her forgettable henchman doing all of it and 3.9 this is the only barbie movie that has felt like a waste of time you know what three i'm de i'm deducting it on the spot three it's not good 12 princesses if you can't tell by the name uh the king in this one has 12 daughters all of them are princesses and that's objectively too many children like i don't want to judge how other people live their lives but like put it away dude like give your wife a break so basically the plot to this one is uh all the princesses they love to dance they love to have fun uh but they get this new aunt lady who's like i gotta teach you how to be ladylike no more dancing dancing's illegal it's like some footloose shit she also bans like color and having fun and she wants to kill the king to take over the land or whatever you know standard villain shit but they cast a magic spell on the villain to make her dance like permanently so she milly rocks into the sunset and the day is saved it's really it's kind it's it's kind of dumb but it's not that bad five out 5.9 barbie's love interest in this one plays a recorder and it's like barbie you could do better than that what are you doing so let's move on to a more interesting movie <laughs> I thought that this one would be bland and formulaic, um, but it's actually really good. I really- I enjoyed this one. There's a song in it called Love is for Peasants, and it's about how only poor people feel love. The song also touches on, like, manipulation, literal treason, and, like, how you shouldn't think thoughts, now go be pretty. It's such an evil song, it's kind of awesome. My biggest gripe with this movie, however, is I don't know who was in charge of their elephant design for this movie, but elephants look like this. They look normal and not scary. Um, but in the Barbie movie, they look like this. Who is forcing all of the Barbie animals to wear eye makeup? It isn't flattering, it's out of place, and it looks like they don't like it either. I don't know if it's animal cruelty or if that's just what happens when you're around Barbie for too long, but either way, it's kind of scary to look at. But enough about that, uh, here's the plot. So the scary elephant and the other talking animals live on an isolated tropical island when a little girl washes up on shore after a storm. So now Naturally, the animals raise her and she somehow turns out to have flawless skin, teeth, and clothing, and language skills despite being raised by animals. I would love to see a realistic version of this movie where it's just Barbie as the wild child. That'd be fun. Mattel could release a line of like wild child Barbie dolls. That'd be fun. There's like a button on her foot that you press and instead of saying like, hi, I'm Barbie, it's like, Ugh. Man, can you imagine if Mattel had the guts to pull stuff like that? That would be so funny. They could release a, a Christian trauma Barbie. That'd be funny. You pull the thing and it's just like, I have guilt. The thing on the box is like, comes with a bunch of emotional baggage. It's just something like that. There could be a punk Barbie, which is the only princess that's canonically snorted Special K uh, in a venue bathroom. <laughs> there could be a grindcore Barbie, which would be the exact same as the punk Barbie, only a little worse. Mattel, I'm just giving away ideas for free. Uh, just write those down. Right, so Barbie is all alone on a remote tropical island, and then the standard love interest shows up on a ship, and at first, I got excited. I was like, oh my god, they're trying to, like, break the mold. Ken is gonna be a pirate. That's gonna be so cool. What a cool dynamic. And nope, uh, he just ends up being a colonizer prince, which is 
way less cool than a pirate, but whatever. They go to civilization together to try and learn more about her past. There's a plot to like poison people or something. Way more enjoyable than I anticipated. I give it an 8.5. It's pretty good. By itself, I think it's a 7.5, but the songs in this one are so good that it immediately bumps it up like a whole number. This one's another musical, so you know it's gonna be a good one. This one's about Barbie and Teresa, and they just have such an enjoyable dynamic. It's actually fun to watch them interact with each other. Anyways, they find a woman trapped in a mirror, and the mirror lady ends up being hunted by an evil witch, so the evil witch destroys their little shack that they live in, which is objectively a really nice shack. I, it's supposed to be that they're poor, but it's a better than like most studio apartments. They go to taverns, uh, a cave, there's like a magical invisible bridge they have to solve a riddle in order to walk on this movie is actually surprisingly skyrim e it's it's actually pretty fun there's also the dogs from the meme that's funny they're here the evil dragon gets one of the dogs from the meme and just like rips into it like a pillow that's kind of funny they defeat the witch and they get crowned the princesses of music uh, which is really cool and then they have a dance battle because how else are children's movies supposed to end? I give this one an eight. It's enjoyable. Wait, do you guys hear that? Snow? <laughs> well, it must be time for it. You know the original plot to Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol? It's just that. I'm not gonna repeat it. Seven. It's a fun movie. This one's actually a great change of pace because Barbie plays Scrooge in this one, meaning she starts off as the villain and just gradually becomes a good person, but it's still really kind of cool to see Barbie be a bad person. It's kind of, it's neat. Which by the way, I'm going to go on a certified crest bag rant here for a second. Whenever a Barbie movie wants to illustrate to the audience that a person is supposed to be bad or ugly on the inside, they just give them a mole on their face. That can't be good to drill into little girl's brains, can it? Not to be rude, but maybe having slightly imperfect skin should not be exclusively correlated with being a horrible person in a thing exclusively shown to little girls. That's kind of... That's kind of bad, right? Because some of the villains, by the way, have actually been decently attractive people. It's just they just put a black dot right there and they're like, oh, now they're hideous. Like, that's weird, right? Regardless though, uh, Christmas Carol is just a really great story and this adaptation is really good. However, nothing beats a Muppet Christmas Carol. That one's the best. If the script was fully original, I would have given this a 10 out of 10, but since it's based purely off of someone else's work, it's kind of capped at a seven, but it's still a really good adaptation. <laughs> This one is hands down the ugliest Barbie movie to date. It is, it's not good to look at. Like, you know, like the standard Mario design and then they did like a new thing. I think it's the Mario RPG remake where he's just like squished down and the proportions are all off. They did that to Barbie in this one. It's, it's just, everyone is ugly. And by the way, since I'm on the topic of looks, um, it is 2009 when this movie came out, at least I think. And Visually, we have not progressed very much at all since the 2001 movie. The lighting is extremely flat, which makes sense for like really early 2000s uh, computer animation, but this is 2009. The original Halo had a better lighting system and that was a video game and it was also being developed pre 9-11. Barbie, what are you doing? Why do the shots at night look like it's filmed day for night? It's animation. Just make it look like nighttime. I don't understand. All right, crust bag rant over. Here's the plot. The Twiller Bees are a type of magical creature and they live in a bunch of wildflowers, but then some big scary businessmen come in with construction equipment and they want to bulldoze over the place where they live so that they can put in a factory or something. The big boss's daughter ends up becoming friends with Thumbelina and they both convince her dad to not bulldoze over their home. It's the standard saving the environment is cool and human destruction is bad type of storytelling and those are pretty universally good in my opinion. It's a good message delivered in an entertaining, albeit ugly, way. Um, I give it a six. Barbie and her friends beat up cops in this one. 
and I'm not even joking. Okay, so here's the plot. Barbie lives on a farm and she really wants to be a musketeer. But literally everyone on planet Earth, whenever she tells them that, are like, you can't be a musketeer. You're a girl. Go in the kitchen. It's like horribly sexist. But someone tries to kill the prince and Barbie and all of her friends react like that one scene in Spider-Man and they like, they just like hit the stuff out of midair. It's kind of cool. And they end up discovering that Tim Curry, who's back by the way, uh, is next in line for the throne. So he's trying to get rid of his competition by like axing the prince. So they have to fight them and all the guards and whatnot. But since the guards are entirely the authority, the law of the land, it is essentially the modern day equivalent of Barbie and her friends just beating the shit out of a bunch of cops. And it rules. Surprisingly hype as fuck. Uh, I give this one a 9 out of 10. Easy. There's a lot of action in this one. And it's surprisingly cool to see Barbie kick a bunch of ass. It's a great change of pace from all the stuffy movies from day one. Also, it ends with a duel on a roof. And it just kind of reminds me of The Crow for some reason. Easily one of the best Barbie movies so far. And I've seen far too many of them. My eyes hurt. I'm gonna watch another one. Barbie does multiple backflips on a surfboard in this one. And I feel like that's as good of an introduction to it I can possibly give. They even do like the surfing GoPro camera angle in this one. So I think that that means that we are officially in the Barbie is cool now stage of the franchise. I think we're now officially out of the classic era of Barbie movies, which thank God there's nothing wrong with them. It's just they are most likely going to be the most boring movies that Barbie is capable of producing. Also, I'm not going to play it for copyright reasons, but there is a point where Barbie raps a little and I don't know whether to add points or to deduct points for that but I feel like it's worth mentioning. All right I'm gonna keep the plot to this one very brief. Barbie is a surfing star whose hair magically turns pink whenever it gets wet with seawater. So she tells her grandpa about it and her grandpa is just kind of like oh yeah that's because you're a mermaid and your mom is the queen of, o of the ocean by the way. There's a bad guy. The bad guy gets defeated. She wins the surfing championship. You get the gist of it. I give this one a 7.2. It's a little by the numbers but the general concept and the way it's executed is actually pretty cool. Infinitely better than their previous attempt at a mermaid movie because that that one was not good. I'm now starting to get why people get so opinionated and end up fighting over which Barbie movies are good or not. Like I can't believe that I'm a 23 year old man developing actual opinions on this. <laughs> All right, I guess I'm gonna go watch seven more Barbie movies. I'll see you tomorrow, I guess. I don't know if it's the screen time or what, but like watching this many Barbie movies is really starting to make my eyes hurt. I'm starting to get some discoloration. Uh, I don't know if it's like a rash, um, but I'm sure it's fine. Anyways. <laughs> This movie is shockingly good. Like, hear me out. Okay, so it starts off with like the standard Barbie movie stuff, right? She's a princess. There's an evil stepmother that's plotting for her downfall, like that whole thing. But then the camera pulls back to reveal a director and cameras and that they're filming this on a soundstage. They are filming a Barbie movie. Like all the Barbie movies we've covered up until this point canonically has been filmed at this location. And I'm not exaggerating either. Barbie's trailer has a poster for the previous Barbie movie we covered in it. It like, it's so fourth wall shattering. It's awesome. And not only is it really cool, it's like a legitimately bold creative direction that I really wouldn't expect from a Barbie movie. It's incredibly meta. Anyways, Barbie ends up getting fired from her own film franchise because she questioned one of the directors and ends up going home to read a bunch of mean hate comments about her online. She's just like me for real. After getting fired, Barbie goes to visit her aunt who is a fashion designer in Paris and she happens to have a magical wardrobe in her attic that turns dresses shiny. That part I don't really like because it's less of a plot device and more so an extremely transparent attempt to just like push merchandise onto their viewers and I look down on that behavior. Please buy it. And basically they have to put on a fashion show and raise a bunch of money. Otherwise uh, her aunt's business is gonna 
go under. It's fun. This movie is the most modern, most relatable Barbie movie to date, and it's actually kind of awesome. Like, it casually mentions tweeting, and the people say stuff like, let's Google it, and it doesn't feel incredibly forced, which is really nice. There's a B-plot where Ken is trying to travel to Barbie, but he's dealing with, like, flight cancellations and, like, public transportation and children crying on airplanes, and it's, like, actual relatable humor, not just, like, wacky hijinks in a fairy tale land, and that's kind of a cool change of pace. Oh, and the fashion show that they hold, it's, like, there's just drum and bass the entire time in the background. It's, it goes so much harder than it needs to. It's a great, entertaining, original story, and I think it's my new favorite. 9.3. Move out of the way, good Barbie movie. We're bringing in a mediocre one next. I'm gonna speed past this one because it's really not worth it. Merlia from the first movie is back and she's still doing surfing competitions, but one of her surfing competitors decides to steal her necklace from her, the necklace that allows her to transform into a mermaid. It's like some Tanya Harding shit. Also, the forgettable villain from the first one is back, only now she has like scary eel henchmen. I kind of like those ones, but they get different defeated in a it's it's whatever it's so forget i just watched it already don't remember 5.7 there we go this movie is a sort of spiritual successor slash sequel, that's hard to say, to the fashion fairy tale, which is my personal favorite one so far. Only in this one, Ken kind of serves as the damsel in distress. Uh, he gets kidnapped by a fairy princess from Gloss Angeles. She wants to marry him, and Barbie and her friends have to go rescue him. It's, it's actually kind of a cool plot. Barbie's house in this one is insane, by the way. This is worth, like, at least 18 million or something. And it got me thinking, how can Barbie afford this? Um, and they actually kind of answer it in this movie, uh, and it's incredibly meta. So, you know how we've established Barbie movies and Barbie movies about Barbie the actress who plays Barbie in these Barbie movies? Well, in this one, fourth wall break Barbie is back, and she gets all of her wealth from the success of the Barbie franchise of all the other movies that are also in the franchise, which is... I mean, it makes sense, but it's like incredibly convoluted for a children's movie, you know what I mean? One of the major things I don't like about this movie kind of plays into that dynamic, however. Like, we've established a real Barbie, which is the Barbie we see in this movie, and we've established a fairy tale Barbie that exists in like fairy tale lands and whatnot. And they decided it would be a good idea to put a real Barbie into a fake fairy tale land Barbie. I don't know, it just seems silly to establish a Barbie grounded in reality only to just immediately make it like all the others it's like what's the point even it's definitely one of the better ones however uh it's an 8.9 the plot for this barbie movie is that she goes to a school to learn how to be a princess which is not how monarchies work when she gets there everyone is all proper and kind of mean to her but she ends up learning about the old royal family who mysteriously died on the exact same day that she got dropped off on another family's doorstep and she ends up piecing together that she is actually a member of the royal family but it was just kept secret from her and basically even though no one at the school likes her she's the only one with a blood tie to the throne so Yay. What a fun, whimsical movie about a hereditary-based political system based in classism. Pretty much, like, half of the runtime is dedicated to, like, learning how to be proper, like, standing up straight and never having any flaws, internally or externally. I genuinely find it really hard to wrap my head around someone enjoying this movie, unless if you're, like, a little girl who also loves strict rules. But it's not all negative because Porsche's in this movie and she is hands down the funniest side character in any of these movies so far. She literally carries the entire movie so much so that it's kind of out of place. Like she feels like she could be a character in like super bad or something. I don't know why she's in a Barbie movie, but they should definitely add her in more stuff. There's also a scene where they have to maneuver through a bunch of lasers and like there's some stealth aspects and none of it really adds up to anything. It mostly just made me want to see a Barbie spy movie. This is foreshadowing. Overall, I give this one a five, but since Portia was so funny, I'm giving it a six. <laughs> You know, for a movie with perfect in the title, uh, this is the worst Barbie movie so far, hands down. Here, I'll give you a quick plot summary. Barbie and her siblings are all getting ready to fly to New York to have a perfect Christmas that's super hyped up in their heads, but their flight gets canceled and they end up getting stranded in the middle of Minnesota. They decide to stay the night at the Tannenbaum Inn where Christy Clausen 
um, get, makes a bunch of toys with her elephs, and it's just, it's really not subtle. You already know that the plot twist is gonna be, oh, it's Santa's workshop. It's it's so obvious. I know it's a kids movie, but like they really layer it on thick. But even though their perfect Christmas is ruined, they still want to make the most of it. So they decide to throw on a rock show with dog dancing as an opener it doesn't make any sense you also got to keep in mind that they are in the middle of a snowed in motel in the middle of the forest and they are planning to throw an event and have a bunch of people show up and somehow a bunch of people show up doesn't make sense this many people decided to drive for at least an hour in legitimately unsafe hazardous conditions just to see a dog jump through a hoop and a girl sing a song and respectfully that is not worth it and then after the show the whole family just like stops turns to the camera looks directly in it and just goes Merry Christmas. And then it just slowly fades to black. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that it is fucking creepy. This is the most passionless Barbie movie I've ever seen. Like every Barbie movie so far, even if it's not a particularly great one, it's very clear that people cared about it. But this one, it just felt like they were just going through the motions. There's no villain, which I don't think is necessary to have in a Barbie movie, but the lack of a villain just essentially made it so there was no agency at all throughout the entire movie. This one is also also a modern Barbie movie, but this one felt modern in a way that was forced. Like, I don't know, man, but like something about hearing Barbie mention podcasting just made me feel gross. <laughs> they also try and like integrate some live streaming aspects into this movie and like the view count is shown by a bar graph. It sucks, man. This one's like a 2.9 out of 10. <laughs> All right, so I know what you're thinking. Uh, didn't they already do this story? Uh, yes. They're just doing it again. <laughs> but I will say I did like this one more. This one has a dog in it with a mohawk named Riff. And I feel like that alone makes it better. I don't even need to explain the plot to this one. A princess and a pop star switch places. They learn life lessons, get into wackiness, sing songs, you know the drill. The princess learns about poverty because she somehow didn't know that existed beforehand. The pop star's manager is evil. She has a magic microphone that allows her clothing to change. And the princess has a magic hairbrush that allows people's hair to change. And hilarity ensues from that. Barbie is a bit of a prankster in this one like she pretty much exclusively uses her magic just to mess with people and that's that's pretty fun to watch it's like a barbie johnny knoxville i don't know i don't really have that much to say about it but it is pretty good eight out of ten all right i'm feeling a little bit barbied out for the day um if my eyes get worse i'll go see a doctor or something but uh i, I think it should be fine uh, all right see you tomorrow all right, so bad news. Uh, the rash has gotten worse. The discoloration is only getting worse. Like there's some abnormal hair growth. I'm not sure what's happening. I think it might be like advanced pink eye brought on by too much screen time. I could I can only guess at this point. Anyways, next movie. Oh great, another Barbie movie about ballet, the most sleep-inducing dance form to possibly exist. Okay, so the plot. Barbie is a ballet dancer, but she tears her shoes, so she goes to get a new pair, and she ends up getting a pair of magical pink shoes that, like, transports her into the world where all these ballets are real. There's an evil snow queen, and she gets defeated by, and I'm not making this up, she gets defeated by Barbie dancing really hard. <laughs> so after she defeats the evil queen in the ballet world, she returns to the real world to dance in a ballet competition uh, where she improvises a bunch of dance moves that her teacher does not approve of, but she ends up doing such a good job that it ends up earning the respect of her teacher. So it's basically the same ending as Whiplash, only replace jazz with ballet and replace J.K. Simmons verbally abusing a bunch of young people with like a kind of hot old woman. And on that note, by the way, the mean, strict, old ballet instructor is just weirdly hot and I don't know why. <laughs> Her entire character is just the basic straightforward mean old lady who's really strict, but for some reason they made her look like she was trad goth 20 years ago but married rich and now no longer like has the energy to try and maintain that anymore. It really doesn't match her personality in the slightest, but I, I appreciate that they did something other than the standard evil old lady look. By the way, just making this video has permanently like ruined content algorithms for me like my previously watched section is just like the house that jack built the sadness enter the void mad god perfect blue children of men mother terrifier the void 
and a Barbie movie about ballet. It's it's just it's ruined. <laughs> but honestly, for a grown man whose only experience with ballet movies are entirely horror related, uh, I enjoyed this more than I thought I would. It's not my personal cup of tea, but I give the first half of this movie a seven and the last half a 5.5. So I'm gonna cut the difference and just give it a 6.4. <laughs> Good news, the scenery in this one does not look like it was made in 1999. Yeah, it took a while, but we're finally there. The animation is more fluid, there's more effort put into the background locations, the lighting looks like it wasn't rendered on a Nintendo 64 anymore, which that's good. They even change up the style completely when they're telling a story, which is a really cool change. As silly as this video is, it is actually pretty cool to see the franchise grow and evolve and like note the technical improvements to the visuals as the years progress. It's I, I find it interesting at least. Also, uh, Barbie almost gets mauled to death by wolves in this one, which is not something that the franchise would have had the guts to do in 2001. I'm gonna give a quick three second plot recap of the movie for you. Barbie and her sisters stop by their aunt's writing academy in the Swiss Alps. The writing academy's logo is based on the legend of a group of wild horses that can run extremely fast and jump extremely high, but no one's ever seen them before. Barbie ends up finding and rescuing one of those legendary horses and enters into a race, she wins first place so that the writing academy doesn't go bankrupt, cheers, clap, end of story, the day is saved. This movie also has an enemies to lovers plotline in it and a villain that likes to hit horses. Jesus Christ. This movie is a bit unbearably high class in my opinion. It's all just like horse shows and multi-million dollar training academies in the Swiss Alps. Like, I feel like any child would have a hard time relating to this movie unless if you're a little girl whose last name is Bezos. It is impressive that they somehow managed to make a compelling and legitimately heartfelt movie about horse jumping, which is one of the most boring rich person sports imaginable. I know a lot of these end with me saying it's surprisingly good, but I really did not expect a Barbie movie about horse jumping to be an 8.9. It's pretty good. This one feels like a sensory video for babies. It's just a, like a lot of colors and jingly keys. Okay, so the plot. So Barbie wants to be a princess and her aunt won't let her leave the house ever, but she eventually gets a thing in the mail for her aunt that's like a royal invite. And she was like, you know what? I'm just gonna take it and I'm gonna go to the ca castle because I'm a rebel. And they end up finding out that her aunt is actually the evil guy's primary assassin. Oh my God, why am I still talking? Why am I watching so many Barbie movies? I'm so tired. Like, I knew that this would be an endurance test, but, like, Jesus. The problem with an endurance test video is it's inherently gonna be hard to sit through, so I don't, I don't even know if anyone's watching anymore. I'm so tired, but it's too late to go back, so let's just keep going. There's a really funny joke in it where a bunch of eel are playing poker together, and one of them goes, hit me, and the other one goes, no can't we just play cards? And like, that's actually a pretty funny joke. And like, I know that this is a movie for children, so some of these are kind of unfair critiques, but like, it does bother me how obvious they make who the villain is right from the get-go. Like, every single time they introduce the characters, it's like, all right, guys, can you guess which one's gonna be the bad guy? Here's a hint, it's the only ones that aren't conventionally attractive. Overall, I give this one a 6.8. Next movie. Not only is this one also a visual leap forward and it looks significantly better than all the previous movies, but it does really switch around with different art styles a lot more in this one. They did that a little bit with the pony one, but it feels like they're fully cranking it up to 10 with this one. Barbie is a princess, big shocker there, and she doesn't really like her princess duties because when being rich is hard. She ends up reading a book about a princess who finds a secret door that goes to a magical land and wouldn't you know it, the princess finds a secret door that goes to a magical land. Who could have seen that coming? The magical land, by the way, is like a mix between like candy land and like nightmare before Christmas. It is actually a pretty cool, unique visual style. By the way, on that note, this movie is not that good. A Disney adults go hard on this movie and it's not, it's fine. It's not that good, man. I'm sorry. All right, moving on. The villain in this movie is an evil princess who keeps trying to like steal everyone's magic in the magical fairy tale land. I know that this is a children's movie, but like there are so many times where the evil villain is just like two feet away from Barbie. 
Why not just like punch her in the face? Like that would actually solve things really quickly. I know that you can't resort to violence in a children's movie, but like just do this, do this, and then the kingdom is saved in 30 seconds. She's actually a child. It probably won't take 30 seconds. Just one solid punch, it's over. Anyways, they defeat her in a non-violent way, boring, and they save the kingdom. Yay. I'm making jokes, but like, it's obvious that they really tried with this one. Like they really cared about this project. It's not at all phoned in. Like it's, it, they went full throttle for this one. But despite it being a legitimately good movie, I do feel like they lean on the staples of the Barbie franchise a little too heavily. Mattel, there are plenty of other aspects that you could play around with instead of just these, I promise you. Anyways, Barbie Secret Window, Secret Garden or whatever is actually a pretty good movie. Solid 8.6. <laughs> Dude, Barbie is a goddamn superhero in this one, so I think we have now finally reached the Barbie experimental era of the franchise. It was around this general time period that Mattel started to shift gears away from home video releases and started to lean more into streaming services. Around this time, there was also a shift narratively to put Barbie in more interesting and diverse situations as well. So even though I was joking about this being the Barbie experimental era, that is actually pretty accurate for the company's mindset around this general time period. Ew, come Company history and actual information. Let's talk about superhero Barbie. She's essentially like a combination of Batman and Spider-Man in this movie. Batman in that she's rich, powerful, and has a lot of resources and a lot of technology, and Spider-Man in the origin of how she got her powers. Instead of Barbie getting bitten by a radioactive spider, it, like the writers essentially just played Mad Libs to replace all the scary words with nice frilly girly ones, which is really funny. Barbie's origin story for this is that she ends up getting kissed on the cheek by a false lash wearing butterfly, and I am not making that up. Her powers include flying, super strength, more hair volume, and a Hadouken, and that is not a joke either. Her superhero name, however, Super Sparkle, which is kind of lame, I gotta admit. This movie is infinitely more chaotic than every other Barbie movie, which both helps set it apart, but also kind of works against it at the same time. A more action-oriented Barbie movie is, in my opinion, kind of interesting, but I could see a lot of parents not really approving of it or whatever, and that driving sales down, so maybe it's not a good move. Her parents end up finding out that she's super sparkle, and she ends up getting grounded from being a superhero. There's a servant that wants to take over a throne, big shocker there, and he gets superpowers, then he defeats his whole, like, a, he makes a, a what's it called volcano erupt to destroy the town and they just block it off and they save the city and yeah you get it also when the movie was starting i thought it might be kind of a wild west movie because barbie's mom in this one got a wagon dude oh my god look at that <laughs> sorry that was, that was an inappropriate joke the reviews were surprisingly harsher than a lot of other barbie movies and i'm not really sure why i thought it was fun i give it a 7.8 out of 10. All right, this movie is essentially just Barbie National Treasure featuring puppies, and that's awesome. I know I'm a grown man watching Barbie movies and there's gonna be some cynicism involved with that, but it, you just, you can't watch a movie about cute puppies and feel anything but joy. It's objectively adorable. So Barbie's sisters end up finding Barbie's old treasure map and they decide to go on a scavenger hunt around town to see if they can get to the bottom of it. The puppies also decide to come along with them on this journey and at no point do they ever decide to leash the dogs, so more like Barbie and her sisters present irresponsible dog ownership. The town is on the brink of bankruptcy, there's some evil carnies who want to steal all the gold and they're essentially just Marvin and Harry from the Home Alone franchise, only car. Carnival. They solve a bunch of riddles and puzzles and do a whole bunch of national treasure Indiana Jones stuff find a whole bunch of gold and they decide to donate it to the city to help save everyone from poverty. Yay. Great pacing, original story. It felt like a breath of fresh air to a franchise that can occasionally be very copy and paste. Really solid children's movie. I'm giving it a nine out of 10. It's a good one. Oh, also the dog has fake eyelashes. <laughs> The plot to this one is super unique. Get this, right? Uh, a princess trades places with, you'll never see this coming, a pop star. Oh wait, we've done this before? Like twice? That's right, remember this movie that they made, which got remade into this movie, which got remade into this movie? That's where we're at on the originality scale. <laughs> Respectfully, Mattel, what are you doing? There's so many other things we could do here. Barbie Wild West, sci-fi Barbie, Barbie in insert sport, B detective Barbie. I all just coming off the top of my head here, Mattel. Hire me. There are so many untapped genres and like different storylines that could be explored. I don't know why you're doing this a third time, but 
All right, anyways, the plot to this one isn't a direct copy and paste from the previous one. It is different, but the themes are exactly the same. They don't full on switch places in life, but the princess does have to go to a pop star school and the pop star has to go to a charm school. It's essentially the same, but not. It's a good movie. It's nothing to write home about though, 6.1. You know how in the last one I was complaining that Mattel needed to branch out more? I kind of forgot that this was the experimental era of Barbie because up next, we have Mission Impossible Barbie, hell yeah. Normally Barbie would have an interest in something like ballet, but in this one she's a pro gymnast, which is much cooler in my opinion. I might be a little biased, but watching someone stand on their tiptoes and slowly go in a circle is not very entertaining, but watching someone do a front flip into a back flip into a triple front flip all while doing it on their tippy toes and standing on a little beam. That is much cooler in my opinion. It is still on brand for Barbie while just being a little bit more interesting and I really like that. Okay, so the plot. So Barbie, Renee, and Teresa are all really good gymnasts. Renee's aunt turns out to be the head of a super secret spy organization and is leading a double life and she wants to recruit all the three girls for a super secret top secret spy mission thing. There's a burglar going around collecting a bunch of like super special gems and if combined it's super destructive insert Thanos joke, you know the drill. And basically the girls just have to find the burglar and stop her. And since it's a spy movie, there's tons of like cool stuff. Like they could go invisible. There's a, a, a talking robot cat. They gotta maneuver through a bunch of spy lasers. And I, I love that. I'm a sucker for that. There's a whole disguise room filled with a bunch of Easter eggs from previous Barbie movies, which I appreciated since I'm being forced to watch all of them. Oh yeah, and Barbie gets a dual lightsaber like fucking Darth Maul in this one. That's pretty cool. I'm not gonna lie. I'm a big sucker for spy movies. I grew up with the original Spy Kids trilogy, which is just goaded. So I acknowledge that I am pretty biased on this, but I enjoyed it. I'm giving it a 7.8. It kind of got some bad reviews, but I don't care. I thought it was fun. All right, so I'm gonna go to a doctor and get my face checked out tomorrow. It should be fine. Should hopefully clear up by tomorrow anyways. Up next is a Barbie Star Wars movie, and I'm pretty excited for that one. So I'm gonna rest my eyes for a little bit, go see a doctor. They'll give me some ointment or something to clear all this up, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. It's too much shit on me. At the beginning of the video, I wondered what would happen if I watched too much Barbie content, and it looks like this is it. When I went to the doctors, all the nurses looked at me and they were like, Yas Queen, which was really sweet, but not the kind of support that I went in there for. I don't know if there are any doctors watching, but as you can see from the reddened pigmentation and it's spread to my lips that uh, this is advanced late stage barbiosis. Thankfully, it's at its red stage, you know, once it hits the pink stage, you're forced to become uh, one of the animals in the Barbie universe. So I'm not fully gone yet, but you know, it's not looking good either. It was recommended that I quarantine, which is why I'm in a different space since apparently it can be contagious. But since I'm quarantining, there's really not much to do. So much like a lung cancer patient smoking a cigarette at the hospital, I might as well kill some time and watch some Barbie movies. We are officially in the end game now. This is the final era of Barbie, the Netflix Presents Barbie era. Anyways, uh, Star Wars Barbie. Normally I joke around with making Barbie comparisons to other movies, but in this one, I'm not joking. She's in space and her powers are essentially just the force verbatim, so it's Star Wars Barbie. The plot to this one is actually pretty interesting. So the universe is dying and the king, who's essentially just Sigma from Overwatch, uh, gets a whole bunch of like aliens who have a lot of powers and sets them up on a mission to try and restart the universe like it's the plot of Sunshine. There's a scene where Barbie and Ken are forced into a duel, which means that this is the first ever Barbie to include domestic violence technically, which is kind of funny. I don't, funny is not the right word to use, but it's, it, no, it's funny. <laughs> in addition to having the force, Barbie is also a pro hoverboarder, but not in like the broccoli haircut way, like the cool space way. And hands down, going 60 miles an hour on like a bunch of sci-fi maps is actually like the coolest Barbie hobby so far. Fuck you, ballet. So long story short, Barbie and her friends go up, restart the galaxy, and then King Sigma's like, you and I aren't so different after all. I respect you, and then credits. This one is the coolest visually out of every single Barbie movie, and I can now officially say that 
having seen all of them. This is the first Barbie movie where at no point does it look dated, which is nice for a change. There's also a bunch of particle simulations. It's it's actually kind of awesome. However, my biggest and essentially only gripe is I do not like this dude's voice at all. He's like permanently stuck in dubbed anime protagonist voice, which actually gets a little annoying after like two fucking minutes. But besides his voice, I give it a nine. It's pretty good. All right, buckle up, because this one, ooh, I have, I have stuff to say about this one. Barbie is a YouTuber in this one, which knee-jerk reaction feels potentially cringe, but it's actually kind of interesting. This movie deals with Barbie getting picked up by an agency who's going to put her in front of way more people, but they are going to control her image and make it so she's not really herself anymore, all for the sake of public perception. It also deals with having a public persona, but not really feeling 100% seen since the persona is never completely real. Not only is this something that I relate to for obvious reasons, but it also one-to-one -one parallels the Barbie brand's relationship to Netflix. A larger company putting Barbie in front of way more people, but also changing what Barbie is in the process. I mean, it, it directly parallels it. So there's a lot of like surprisingly meaty layered themes in this Barbie movie, like way more than you'd expect. I know what you're thinking. Wow, that actually sounds interesting, complex, and original. And you are correct, but I am leaving out one one major thing. She finds a princess and they switch places. Again. Mattel, we talked about this. What are you doing? But you know, besides that, I ended up finding myself getting pretty invested in this movie. There's tons of references to previous Barbie movies. They even reuse some locations from previous movies, which is a really cool Easter egg that most people won't pick up on unless if you watch all of them in one sitting. I'm giving this one an 8.8 .8 on the Barbie scale. I would give it an 8.9, but Barbie shuffles on a horse and I'm gonna have to deduct a point for that. I gotta be real with you, I don't really like this one, so I'm not even gonna bother committing uh, the script to memory. I'm just gonna read my notes. We're just gonna speed past the plot. So, Ken is studying marine biology, he's unknowingly working for an evil corporation, and they are capturing the fabled gemstone dolphins, and his boss is also really mean. Barbie becomes friends with this lady, and it turns out she's actually a mermaid, and she's also friends with the captured gemstone dolphins. Wow. Together, they rescue the dolphins that were captured by the evil corporation, and it's just it's so painfully fine it's okay these newer netflix barbie movies are good but like barbie mostly takes a back seat to her sisters which is kind of lame like instead of barbie being like i want to see the world and i'm gonna defeat an evil witch now it's just barbie like doing chores while her sisters have fun and like that's that's lame. That's disappointing to see. I don't know. I didn't really like this one this much i'm giving it a 4.5 and speaking of mediocre barbie movies Puppy Chase. This movie does not hold a candle to Puppy Adventure, dude. Like, this, that movie was so fun and adventurous. This movie just feels so hollow. It's, it's offensive. Once again, I'm also just gonna read my notes. I'm not gonna memorize it. This one sucks. The plot is that Barbie and her sisters have to go to a remote island for Chelsea's dance recital. Also, the puppies from the previous movie are here now. Why did they come along? I don't know. But anyways, the puppies get lost and they, they spend the whole movie looking for them and it sounds fun but it really isn't four out of ten this movie only needs to be 20 minutes long but they somehow stretched it into over an hour don't do that outside of some dancing horses them still not leashing their dogs and it ending in a dance battle there's really just not much to say anyways we're gonna move on to a more interesting movie barbie in cyber chase i mean barbie video game hero This movie, and I'm not making this up, it starts off with an integrated advertisement for the video game Just Dance, which is a horrible way to start a movie. Alright, so the plot to this one is that Barbie is the most famous in the gaming land, whatever that means. So she gets summoned and pulled into a video game so she can defeat the emoji virus. I, kn I know, it's so bad. I really want to like this movie, but they keep saying the word noob over and over again, so the people writing it have no idea that it's not 2011 anymore. Anyway, she has to beat the whole game and not lose a single time, and that'll defeat the emojis. God, I hate saying that. She goes through a racing game, a Candy Crush slash Angry Birds game, and a Minecraft parody. But the final game that she has to defeat is, wouldn't you know it? Just Dance. Where they also imply to their audience of children that it's their favorite game too. 
gross. Literally right when you find yourself sort of enjoying the movie, they go, hey kids, buy this product. You love this game, right? Tell your parents to buy it. I know that all these movies are to sell products to some degree, but th the product placement in this one was like especially egregious. Also, some of the video game worlds that they visit have a stylized frame rate, which sounds cool on paper. You're thinking like, you know, into the spider verse, but it's more like a like a like a gif. It looks bad. I get that it was probably easier to animate But it just looks like a mistake and it gets nauseating to look at after like 10 seconds This movie would have been awesome in 2011. However, they are 12 years too late I give it a 7 but I am bumping it down to a 6 just because of all the just dance stuff because they 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 need to be slapped on the wrist for that That was awful I really don't want to go on a negative streak of reviews. I don't like doing that. This one has a lot of cool ideas, but overall, it this one's also just kind of eh. Like, Barbie is a family vlogger in this one, and like, that's gross. Like, <laughs> like, it makes sense. The only people that watch those kinds of videos are children, and Barbie is a children's thing, but like, as an adult, it's just like, ew, family vloggers? gross. Also, they like, they give Barbie a whole bunch of like, like millennial catchphrases like, mm, that was awkward. And it's, it's just, ooh. like one of her sisters starts flossing and then like Barbie goes like, mm, that just happened. And it's like that dude, I want to like this movie, but dog, you're making it hard. <laughs> Funny enough, it makes me genuinely miss the like 2000s and 2010s era of Barbie stuff. Like it, it, it was trying to be dignified and like pure in a sense, which I originally scoffed at, but now that it's gone and replaced with like, whoa, new sound effects, whoa. Now it's like, oh man, I kind of prefer a story about a princess learning about responsibility than like, slip on a banana peel fart noise sound effect children's movies, you know what I mean? Okay, so here's the plot. So all of them are on a cruise together, which immediately means I don't like them. We all know that the Roberts family is rich, but like people who take cruises are rich and also the worst, you know? There is a lesbian pirate on the cruise though, and that that is pretty cool, I'm not gonna lie. Chelsea, who's Barbie's youngest sister, is looking forward to having her birthday on the cruise, and, and they go to sleep and they wake up on her birthday, but it just so happens that while they were asleep, they crossed the international date line, so it went from the 9th to the 11th, meaning that they completely skipped Chelsea's birthday, which would actually be pretty distressing if you're a child. Chelsea ends up hearing about there being an island that they're passing by that has like a magical gem to grant a wish and she wants to wish for her birthday to be back. So she goes to the island and there's talking animals and it's, there's a uh, <laughs> there's a talking sunflower that Chelsea screams in horror when she sees and that's pretty funny. A whole bunch of island hijinks ensue and she wishes and then she wakes up back on the boat. Was it all a dream or did her wish come true? I don't know, you decide. It's fine. It's a f it's an okay movie. I give this one a 6. The overarching plot is pretty good, but the minute to minute moments uh, are kind of lame. <laughs> This one starts off completely black and white, except for a single pink car driving through downtown New York City. I am a huge sucker for black and white featuring accent color, if you can't tell, so I really loved this intro. In this one, Barbie wants to be a Broadway singer, so she goes to a art school in New York to learn how to do that, where Malibu Barbie meets Brooklyn Barbie, where they're the same person, but they're not, and the movie just glosses over how cosmically terrifying that is. These two honestly have great chemistry together, and it's actually fun to watch these two girls try and make it in New York City than it is to watch Malibu Barbie set a good example for her sisters. That's lame. That is until Malibu Barbie ends up getting expelled from the art school because she gets framed as sabotaging competition, all because she slipped and fell and accidentally sprained Brooklyn's ankle. These two getting into a fight thinking that they're sabotaging the other and it feels like watching your parents get a divorce, it's surprisingly upsetting. I think that this is the first example of real, kind of intense interpersonal conflict in a Barbie movie. It's the only time where one of these animated films actually kind of made me feel sad. But everything turns out okay and they end up performing a song together in Times Square or whatever. 8.9 out of 10. It's surprisingly good and I hope to see more of Malibu and Brooklyn's dynamic in the future. All right, I spoke too soon. Brooklyn is back. Yay. However, this is not a good movie, so boo. This movie is an unofficial sequel to the Dolphin Magic one, which also wasn't that good. I wrote a whole thing for this movie. I don't even think I want to read it. It's just, it's not worth it. The villain from the previous movie is back and she wants to uncover the truth about mermaids. All the mermaids are like trying to find the avatar who could control all the elements and, and will save them from the 
pollution. There's a scene where an underwater vessel starts collapsing, which has aged, interestingly. I don't know, I'm moving past this one. It's cool on paper, but it's not that good in execution. I give it a five out of 10. Okay, this one I am actually excited to talk about. Do you guys remember Black Mirror's Bandersnatch? That really cool interactive Netflix thing. I think it was their first ever interactive piece and everyone was really excited. Like, oh, this is where media is going. This is where Netflix is going to take it. And then they just like didn't make any more interactive stuff. Well, they did do it again and its return is a Barbie movie, which, <laughs> which I don't think anyone saw coming. And I'm going to be real with you guys here. Um... This one's awesome. It's also one of the only times in a Barbie movie things get kind of scary, which is why it's funny enough tagged with fear. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's pretty good. The plot to this one is Barbie is faced with two major life choices. She could either stay with Brooklyn and pursue music or go home to her friends and Ken. And she wants to figure out what her life path is going to be while on a road trip with these two. There are two main routes and a whole bunch of different endings, including like a secret alien ending, which is pretty cool. It's like Silent Hill. And all the different paths and places you could go. You could go to like the state fair and like a dinosaur themed amusement park. Camping, getting lost in the woods. There's like a flooded thing that you gotta figure out how to get past. I'm not gonna go fully into detail about it because if I did that I would be talking for three hours but it's on Netflix. Honestly, Try it out. It's it's a fun way to kill an hour or two. It's it's surprisingly fun. I also just generally love choose your own adventure stories, but they stress me the fuck out. Even with Barbie, anytime I made a choice that bummed out one of the other characters, I would feel so bad. Out of all the super modern Netflix movies, this one is undoubtedly the best and most versatile. It's like if Supermassive made a game for children. It's surprisingly cool. I highly encourage Mattel to make more interactive Barbie stuff like this. It's really fun. And that's why I give this one a 9.5. And now for the moment you've all been waiting for. Now that I've officially seen every single Barbie movie in the franchise, give or take a few exceptions, I think I'm finally ready to go see Barbie 2023. Let's go. All right, so as per tradition, I got on a pink shirt. It's a Carl Weezer shirt. I, I'm not wearing my makeup because uh, this is this is a small town in Ohio. I don't, I don't know if they're gonna kill me. So I made my way to the theater, had the stalest popcorn I've ever had in my entire life, and then ended up getting a private screening because no one else went to go see this movie because it's way past its release date. So as the lights dimmed and Maria Menounos said her final goodbyes, it was finally time to watch the Barbie movie. I really like that movie. I'm gonna keep my thoughts on it brief because people way smarter and way more qualified to talk about it uh, has done so extensively already, but I really liked it. I damn near enjoyed pretty much every aspect of it. Now that I've seen it, I understand why so many right-wing losers threw such a big hissy fit over it. I mean, they throw a hissy fit over everything, but I understand it. This actually addresses like problems in society and they're allergic to that, so it makes sense. I haven't seen this be discussed before, at least personally, uh, and I'm not the most educated on the subject, but. I believe that they were only allowed to use the Barbie IP prior to 1990 for this movie. That's why all the Barbie references were like old school and never referenced like modern Barbie or modern Barbie characters. I think that that's why. I don't really have a greater narrative takeaway. I just felt like pointing that out because I feel like that was interesting. I'm also happy that this movie was such a huge success for Greta since I loved Lady Bird, so it's good to see more of that. I know that this whole video is made to lightheartedly poke fun at the entire Barbie franchise, but let me be clear in that I enjoyed my time making this video and a lot of the Barbie movies I did actually legitimately enjoy even though that's a little embarrassing to admit for some of them. To spend all this time watching all these different Barbie movies and to have it come to a close with a genuinely good emotionally layered mature look at Barbie felt legitimately cathartic. This movie will go down in history as the first ever 10 out of 10 on the Barbie scale. We finally did it. If you somehow haven't seen it already and yet you're willing to watch over an hour of a Barbie themed YouTube video, I don't know what's wrong with you. You should go see it right now. And with that, I have nothing left to say, but bye Barbie.